to welcome you, everybody, colleagues, friends, uh, former students of Paolo, and uh, all the community, the entire community of biorobotics, to open this workshop on. Nineteen eighty nine on bionics, and uh, so I leave the floor to Paolo Dario for his uh, opening speech. And uh, please enjoy this workshop and participate to our discussion. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> to share, can I share? Just a few seconds, let's share. Okay. Okay, just repeat my welcome. It's a real privilege and uh, and uh, honor uh, to be here again with uh, many of you who participated in this, uh, this the historical meeting, uh, or we can say so, on uh, bionics uh, that we held in uh, June uh, 1989. At that time, most of, of us participants were pretty young and uh, uh, we decided to start investigating uh, with the energy of youth uh, what was a, a new field, field of uh, uh, bionics. And today, in fact, the title of the event is Bionics Today. Uh, we would like to uh, discuss where we are and also maybe to uh, suggest some uh, new avenues for investigation in, uh, in this field. Um, yeah, um, uh, in the 80s, my personal dream was inspired among many, I must say, uh, by, by science fiction. This was one of uh, dreams uh, I had, and many of us had. It is to develop a, the most advanced hand prosthesis available in the world, amputees. There was a sort of mix between uh, science fiction and the feasibility. But this was a uh, part of uh, the inspiration because uh, Robotics uh, uh, was evolving, uh, beginning uh, 60s, uh, in, a, in a very uh, fascinating and uh, interdisciplinary field in which uh, the solid uh, stream of uh, industrial robotics started to be mixed uh, with other disciplines, especially scientific disciplines, and also with uh, bioengineering because uh, many of us uh, uh, were uh, inspired and driven by the idea of uh, understanding and substituting uh, biological functions. So uh, what was uh, bionics? Actually, if we go back, uh, the epistemology of uh, uh, bionics uh, has uh, its roots in uh, fields like uh, proto-cybernetics, so Loeb, Jennings, and cybernetics, so especially Wiener. The idea was uh, to pursue what uh, was uh, a unified approach to the study of living organisms and machines. So this was the idea. Actually, the background was not a traditional one from uh, an industrial robotics that was very much driven by control, but it was uh, uh, this area here. Uh, cybernetics. Um, uh, bionics started sort of officially in the United States uh, in 1958 uh, with a, a meeting sponsored by science. 
And uh, the term bionics at that time was uh, about a lifelike system that copies some function and characteristic of a natural system. Was very prestigious because uh, science was the main sponsor and actually uh, the publisher of what was published at that time. So what happened in those years in the 80s is that uh, I myself decided to visit and talk to one of the main actors of this field that was Henning Edgar von Gierke, who was active in the Wright-Patterson Air Force bases. And I talked with him personally, exchanged ideas in a whole afternoon while my wife and daughters were waiting outside. And uh, uh, so I learned from him uh, uh, many, many things uh, and also we discussed about the context of bionics. At that time, the context was the one of the uh, Cold War. This was the period in which bionics was really originated. And uh, many of us, let's say the one who are a bit uh, aged, uh, remember uh, what was the context. And the idea was to investigate the behavior of animals, uh, to use animals, uh, for example, uh, uh, applications uh, as uh, for spying or other kind of activities. Um, what happened, and this is this was a personal communication that I received by uh, von Gierke, is that uh, the reputation of bionics was sort of destroyed by the use uh, or the abuse, if you will, of these terms in, for example, TV series like the Bionic Woman, women, and so woman actually, and uh, the funding from uh, the National Science Foundation and other agencies declined uh, sharply, uh, so that the field was considered as almost uh, uh, died. But what happened in those years is that uh, Italy, and I'm very proud of it, uh, and the colleagues of Genoa, you know, my, my friend Giulio and uh, Sandini, and my uh, former friend uh, and uh, master, actually, Cenzo Tagliasco, uh, also Pietro Morasso, who is attending, in Genova, essentially, this idea of anthropomorphic robotics. You know, Vincenzo Tagliasco was the first in the world to use uh, this uh, uh, title for his chair really predicting the future. So what we did at that time was to discuss about uh, the future of this area and uh, together with uh, Giulio, who's sitting next to me, my friend and colleagues and Patrick Abisher, we decided to propose uh, to NATO, uh, but it was of course not military event, uh, the organization of a new seminar, a seminar that we organized in Italy in 1989, and the title was Robots and Biological System, and it was a quest of mine towards a new bionics. Uh, and, uh, and the future came from there, and most uh, of uh, uh, the persons, uh, our friends and colleagues attending uh, even today meeting, because this uh, is a fantastic the idea that uh, was actually conceived uh, by Cecilia mostly. And, uh, and Giulio later, I was uh, totally unaware, but the idea was uh, to consider what has happened in those 32 years. And uh, uh, many of uh, uh, the colleagues who are attending, who are colleagues and friends, really participated actively in uh, these uh, events, you know, and uh, they, their papers are including in uh, in the book uh, that is uh, uh, actually in front. Uh, and uh, they authored uh, many, if you will, uh, uh, components of what together uh, makes uh, bionics. But at that time, we were really pioneers, uh, not naming uh, all of my, our friends, uh, but all of them uh, contributed. They were in presence, but they also contributed to, to the, in particular, for example, uh, here are uh, is uh, Zalino, Massimo Bergamasco, just to name, and uh, uh, Danilo De Rossi, who, who is here with us physically with Supino and uh, Massimo. We were really working, for example, with artificial fingertips or artificial retina sensor, truly bionics approach inspired by, by nature and, and, and other colleagues, of course, okay? Uh, including Rowdy Brooks, Toshi Fukuda, and others. Some of them unfortunately passed away. Some others are uh, likely here. So what happened next? What we learned in the following years? 
So we learned that uh, uh, bionics is in fact something that is in between science and engineering. You know, at that time, it was easy to say this, but the reality was very, very uh, different. Uh, but this, uh, uh, and, and this is also a personal story, if you will, is something that uh, we were able to organize in something structured, in which uh, there is uh, some part for science and there is part uh, for engineering. So, for example, biomimetics, uh, bioinspiration, uh, artificial organs, uh, uh, and, and medical robots, how to interconnect these things. And, uh, you know, many of us, and here are uh, just uh, some examples, but essentially these started design robots not for any real application, but just as tools for science, for investigating. Uh, fundamental issues like locomotion, like uh, grasping, uh, like uh, motion control, uh, like uh, uh, vision, uh, and, and many such uh, problems. And we learned that science, in fact, is really driving many, many uh, deep innovations, sometimes disruptive, radical innovation. At that time, this was not so clear, even in our community. Robotics was something that uh, uh, was considered as a technology, not really as a, as a science. Uh, and, uh, but we were inspired by the workshop to think about, and uh, for example, learning that in fact, many uh, technical innovations come from a deep understanding of uh, uh, principles. So from discoveries, is the connection between discovery and invention. And this became more and more, I would say, consolidated. Uh, Rodri Brooks, uh, who, who is probably here, I hope so, uh, actually was one of those who demonstrated with uh, disruptive uh, uh, ideas and discoveries, if you will, in the field of intelligence, uh, the disruptive paper that was called Intelligence Without Representation, that, however, he used to develop what is now the Roomba that has been sold a million and million pieces. And this is based on this discovery. So you see the connection between discovery and uh, invention. And uh, of course, uh, as a roboticist, that is our example of what we have done and we're still doing uh, in the Biorobotics Institute, lots of applications. But, you know, and, and bionics, of course, has evolved. Uh, there are here colleagues who are working on new artificial organs, artificial skins, in a most very, very professional, if you will, manner in which uh, science and engineering are connected. So the future and actually the present of bionics uh, is uh, now very bright, uh, very, very uh, practical also. We are talking about giving uh, sight uh, to people to, to blind, uh, uh, or, or of course it's common to give back uh, audition to uh, uh, deaf. And uh, uh, more, more in, in, a, in a more practical, say systematic way, this was, uh, in fact, recognized by the birth of science robotics. You know, science robotics is based on this idea. Actually, I contributed as founding editorial board member uh, to, to state that science for robotics or robotics for science uh, are really uh, what uh, could be uh, revolutionary, if you will. And in fact, the impact factor of science robotics is now 23.7 that is incredibly high, showing that this probably is a, a good way uh, to go. And uh, very briefly, in our institute, we started publishing very, very high quality papers, okay? On, for example, nature, I, I'm not mentioning all colleagues, but those are uh, colleagues uh, and students who published on nature, uh, who published uh, like Cecilia and Barbara and Matteo Cianchetti on soft on science robotics uh, uh, and more science robotics again Leonardo Arianna who are here and uh, nature machine intelligence Michael Controzzi Francesca Cini and and so on. nature again Michael Capogrosso Silvestro Michera you know these things uh, or uh, nature biomedical engineering Anarita Cutrone Silvestro Michera and, and, and more, you know, for example, here, this is the work of uh, Gastone Ciuti on Nature Review Scientific Rep. So, and uh, 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 colleagues like uh, Christian Cipriani, who is the director who has an ERC 
project on, uh, if you will, uh, an area of bionics, new generation of hand prosthesis. So just to say that this is becoming now fully accepted. 32 years ago, this was not the case. It was a dream, but it was not a reality. And at the same time, we were able to uh, have uh, a new transaction accepted on medical robotics and bionics that is now quite established and I would say successful and many of, of you are in fact a member of the editorial board. And a course, a Master of Science program together with the University of Pisa in bionics has been established in bionics engineering, very successful with the University of Pisa with IMT Luca. And so it's another consolidation and many successful products derived from our spin-off companies in fields related to bionics. Uh, I'm going to conclude with uh, some uh, considerations about uh, 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 innovation and the future, because in part, you know, I've been inspired uh, with all these, uh, like uh, uh, Shigeru Rose from uh, science fiction, for example. And we know that predicting the future is not easy. There is the famous case of uh, uh, Blade Runner, while, for example, people like uh, Steve Jobs uh, demonstrated that uh, a, a disruptive innovation can create uh, incredible discontinuity. So the point is how to search for, how to encourage our students to explore this. And these are examples showing from, again, a, a Nobel Prize winner we are moving towards robotics, uh, again, from science, uh, from discovery to engineering. And uh, these are kind of discontinuities that we would like to, uh, that are not based only on the technology roadmaps, but on the strong injection of new science into engineering. This is another important lesson. And, Still, science can really lead to disruptive innovation robotics. There are many, many cases. This was something that happened in the following years, together with Julio, together with Patrick, together with many of you, uh, and uh, neuroscientists, for example, the sense of movement that was not part of the traditional robotics uh, avenue, the role of uh, perception. And here, you know, there are many colleagues, actually, some of those uh, uh, participating in uh, this debate. So prediction, for example, very important. Uh, Regina uh, Baci, but also uh, Mark Reibert have worked a lot about uh, dynamics and push. And you see here a picture, by the way, uh, Atsu Takanishi, and, uh, and myself and uh, Lambert Toz about uh, this project and the work on body intelligence. Also, this is a revolutionary approach. Intelligence may not be only in the brain, but in the body. And here, uh, Cecilia has been a leading person. So innovation makes dream true. This is my conclusion. Five minutes, yes, I finish in five minutes. Thanks. So innovations make dream, dreams true. This is uh, one of the main lessons I can share with you 30 years after this uh, pioneering uh, event. You know, from Asimov uh, to transistor technology to Engelberg and, and robotics uh, to uh, the injection of uh, technology that could not be predicted before. You know, in 1989, there was no cell phones. There were no cell phones. There were no web user, usable in the real set. Today we have all these, we have cloud, and so probably we can really consider many innovation as true. And the, really the final message is about dreaming. I always encourage uh, our students uh, to dream, even about uh, what seems impossible. Those are examples. And uh, going back, this is an important thing. We are living here next to Florence, next to Vinci, and uh, examples like uh, a Dome of the Cathedral of Florence are about dreaming what seemed impossible. And this is uh, a sort of uh, uh, icon of the Italian Renaissance, okay? dreaming about uh, what nobody could do at that time. But the decision makers were confident in that. And I like this concept very much about building cathedrals, you know. And this 
sentence that I take from uh, the Ken, Ken Follett book, of Pillars of the Earth, you know. It is very inspiring. Two workers are piling up bricks along the road. A traveler passes by and inquires about their work. And one modestly replies, I'm heaping bricks. And the other exclaims, I raised a cathedral. I would like that our students uh, think about that, you know, inspired by the place where uh, many scientists like Leonardo actually uh, this is a real smart city where Raffaello, Leonardo, and Michelangelo work together, 1506. This is a smart city populated by smart citizens, with Leonardo inspiring uh, the work of human body. And uh, actually, we organized a workshop about it. So to, to really conclude, uh, you see here what happened in uh, those years. Okay, There are names, faces. Uh, and this two feel from the dream of uh, a new prosthetic hand uh, to this, the divergence, if you will, that is always connected between prosthetics, uh, real uh, actors in that field, and robotics. And you see here uh, names of uh, uh, my students, in a sense, uh, my colleagues now who became those who really realized the dreams uh, of that. And, uh, all this uh, is about uh, accepting challenges, okay? So moving from the component to systems and uh, uh, having the courage of building cathedrals, if you wish, exploring new fields. And uh, this is the reason how many people were attracted. You need to have dreams to inspire and, uh, to, in and to address problem like ethics and to involve colleagues you know Julio was there at that time about uh, grand scientific challenges and this is the end uh, where are we now we are in a very articulated domain if you will this is something that is today by robotics and bionics uh, we are 32 years after this uh, pioneering event uh, in uh, in a uh, through this kind of realization in uh, what uh, uh, Steve Jobs in his famous speech uh, uh, defined as uh, uh, connected the dots. So today we can connect uh, the dots uh, uh, that were not connected in 1989. Thank you very much. Maybe I just give the floor to uh, my friend and uh, colleague, Giulio Sandini, for his talk. Thanks, Paolo. Let's see if I can share my screen. Thanks. Always uh, some stimulating discussions uh, and presentations. Uh, stories and, and this, uh, sorry I'm just trying to close okay that's that's fine okay uh, so yeah I, I was always uh, impressed by by Johnson this uh, time even if uh, you know he's getting old you know the occasion here today is because he's 70 today <laughs> so we need to also besides talking about science appreciate what uh, what he is doing i'm i'm much older than him of course i mean just uh, just a few months but <laughs> that's nice so let's uh, let's see if we can start if i can start my presentation so uh, bionics to me you know is is the study of the mutual role of body and mind in the building of biological intelligence uh, and uh, you know this is also the reason why i am a good friend of paolo you know because body and mind i mean uh, we are both bioengineers but paolo is a, me a mechanical engineer i am a computer scientist uh, uh, as a background and so it's this uh, uh, mix of uh, of uh, ingredients which has uh, brought us together and still keeps us uh,
together uh, uh, now. So this, uh, you know, this, if, if you have to stretch uh, uh, to, to, to synthesize what uh, intelligence is or what uh, we should do, I think we should uh, go, you know, along this line, basically increasing both the uh, compliance of the body and, and learning of, of the mind. And, you know, this is uh, the, the article we published uh, in the book, uh, which are sort of uh, a revamping uh, uh, today. And, and I will uh, try to go through the history, I mean, as Paolo has done, you know, the last years, but uh, ending up with a list of uh, topics which I think we have a little bit uh, uh, failed along these, um, the, these years. But before doing that, uh, I want to, to make you explicitly aware of how much time has passed. And I have this video here, you know, which is uh, basically four months before the workshop in 1989, and it is uh, the equivalent of the Zoom uh, up today, you know, this was, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was still, I was not dying uh, my head white at that time. So that's, that's the, the situation there. And it was a, a, a link, uh, you know, it was a, a, a teleconference, uh, the, the very first teleconference between uh, Pisa and, and, and Genova. And then you can see uh, Paolo here, he was not shaving his head uh, at that time, you know, and, and uh, it, uh, it is, is, you know, and Massimo Bergamasco and, uh, and Tazzo is, is there. So, I mean, these were the times when the, the conference was held. This was the technology that, that, uh, that we had at that time. So, but how did, we, how did we arrive there? Or at least how did I arrive at this, uh, you know, 1985? You know, if I have to start, I mean, uh, again, the names that Paolo mentioned already, these were my masters. And, and I was uh, sort of going along through uh, two different uh, paths, you know, studying eye movements uh, on one side with uh, uh, Piero Morasso and Emilio Bizzi, and also, you know, studying the neurophysiology of vision with Lamberto Maffei and, and, Adriana, and Adriana Fiorentini uh, at that time. And, uh, you know, uh, in, in parallel, my engineering heart was beating for computer vision. And these were the times uh, of David Marr and, and Tommy Poggio and this group of uh, fantastic people at the ninth floor of the uh, artificial intelligence lab of, of MIT, you know, and, and the, 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 the two fields were sort of progressing in, in parallel somehow with, uh, with some uh, uh, really highlights by, by by David Marr and, and you know, it was, uh, uh, it was uh, at that time that uh, I realized that I could merge the two fields, you know, the computer vision and, uh, and uh, the, the uh, engineering and, and the, uh, the neurophysiological path. So that was the start of this anthropomorphic retina-like structure at, at that time. But, you know, computer vision was based on, on models. You know, the, the model-based vision was called at that time. And, and you know, the, the, the brain was a geometric engine, according to this, to this stream of research. But soon after that, you know, that was this uh, uh, active uh, vision uh, revolution, you know, and Rugina, who is uh, attending today, and Yanis uh, uh, Aloimonos and David Ballard, uh, and Dana Ballard, sorry, they, 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 they basically brought up the idea that you can, uh, you can uh, uh, move uh, the observer, you know, and th th exactly at that time, there was what I call the Brooks Trilogy, which also Paolo mentioned, you know, this elephant don't play chess or the whole iguana, you know, uh, demonstrating and starting to discuss that, you know, robotics could also be simple, uh, not, does not necessarily have to be a very complex. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and at, at that time, uh, I think it was uh, uh, the time where uh, mostly in Japan, in fact, people were building uh, robot uh, legs and hands and, and, and eyes, you know. Um, and and uh, this was really uh, also uh, changing uh, the, the, the feeling, you know, we, we, we were talking about robots in, the, in uh, car automation, you know, and, and that was, uh, uh, that was the, the field at that time. And I was still going on with this log polar image processing, but this time uh, addressing motion not necessarily shape or, 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 or other. 
things. So in this, uh, this is the time where the workshop was, uh, was organized, you know. The, the, the word uh, understanding uh, was uh, uh, popping out, at least in my, in my field. And, and uh, you know, with Paolo, we met at the ISRR 87 in Santa Cruz. And, and, and that was the time when we decided to organize this, uh, um, uh, this workshop. And you have to consider that you know, computational neuroscience was invented uh, as a field uh, around that time. So now we give it for, for, for granted, but that was the time uh, the workshop was organized. So very, very much uh, back. So what happened du during that year? Well, certainly during the, during the following years, uh, uh, you know, there was development of uh, different kind of robots in, in, uh, in projects which are, uh, you know, national project. And this was the time where, you know, with the University of Genova, I was there and, and Santana, we did a lot of, uh, a lot of projects together. You know, this uh, UNITA, this uh, URMAD project or the AgRobot project uh, goes back at that time. And, you know, this Dexter, the very first, uh, uh, the very complicated arm that was built by Scienza Machinale and, and Massimo Bergamasco. Uh, so these were the years for me, at least, of advanced robotics. You know, 1991, the conference on advanced robotics was organized in, in Pisa by, by Paolo and, and, and his group. And, you know, we were sort of following the advanced robotics projects in Japan, which was uh, more or less ending at that time, you know, when, when uh, we decided to start. So this was the robotic side. But from the neuroscience aspects, there was a big change, you know, and the big change was that, you know, research was going from uh, studying isolated uh, functions uh, into uh, more integrated uh, uh, sensory information, for, for example, and actions, you know, this uh, Le Sens de Mouvement by, by David, by, by Alain Berthoz is 1997. So the, it was along these years that there was a big change uh, in, in my view. And, and also around the end of those years, uh, you know, these uh, mirror neurons that are another milestone in, in my thinking about how to build uh, an intelligent systems. So, so what's next? Uh, well, next, uh, you know, I, I took a sabbatical year at MIT and, and I was uh, in uh, what uh, Rodney Brook organized and called the zoo which is a creation, uh, is a colorful collection of interesting people who don't fit into any of the established categories. This, uh, this is how Rolf Pfeiffer defined it. You know, we, had, uh, we have uh, philosophers, uh, engineers, uh, psychologists, uh, theologians, uh, you know, and we were discussing about, uh, uh, well, in general about intelligence, you know. So, so this was uh, a, a, another crucial milestone for me after the... the workshop and in fact you know these first workshops I uh, another workshops I organized in Geneva on artificial systems and neurosciences list uh, many people which uh, have drawn I mean that uh, driven my my research interest uh, since those time it was the years for me of developmental robotics you know studying how to the how to build a system which can become intelligent not uh, building a system which is intelligence you know with the idea of uh, developing systems not only able to act but also to understand again you know that uh, that was uh, uh, these uh, these mirror neurons i was still continuing uh, you know with this uh, retina like sensor coming up to a 32000 pixels uh, sensor but you know this is uh, not the important uh, point of those years to me it was the push uh, of robot cognition at least in europe there was a very big push on that, you know, and, and uh, these are the, the, the number of papers published uh, with the word, uh, uh, with the two words, robot and cognition in, in the main, in the main, uh, in the main keywords uh, uh, extracted from, uh, from Explore. So you can see that there was a big, a big jump. And, you know, these are all the projects, you know, and most of them, and some of them, neuro robotics or robot cab, were done with Paolo and, and the group here in Pisa. And, and, that, uh, and that is, uh, this, uh, what brought up, uh, you know, the, the following part, which was the Robot Cab Consortium and the ICAB. Why am I mentioning this? Because it's a multidisciplinary project. You can, you can see here the names of the people that were participating in, in uh, the project. You know, we have now, uh, you know, 45 ICAB all around the world. So 
the, 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 the project was, I think, one of the most successful projects uh, uh, of the EU. And this project was continued within IIT when IIT started in 2005 with the idea of studying human and humanoid and, and the interaction. Uh, and, and, you know, going uh, uh, using, uh, in this case, the robots uh, as wind tunnels to study social interaction. So using uh, uh, the ICAB uh, as a stimulus. And, you know, this is uh, the group. Now I, 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 my group is three people, you know, and, and this, uh, but, you know, uh, Francesco Rea and Alessandra Schutti are, are, are continuing. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm almost 71. This is my main successful, <laughs> my main success. There are people continuing along this, uh, uh, this path. And, and, and so uh, uh, how did we do since uh, 1985? Well, certainly we have not delivered the system we promised, you know. Uh, after all, we are doing research. But I think we have learned a lot, you know, perhaps more from neuroscience than, than engineering. But in many senses, uh, our ideas, at least my idea, on how to build an intelligent system has changed uh, along these years. Uh, we also have realized that, uh, you know, building artificial systems can be useful to understand humans uh, and vice versa, you know, understanding humans is necessary to build uh, intelligent systems. So, so we are basically asking the same scientific questions there. Uh, certainly along this year, we moved from general purpose vision uh, to actions and multimodality, you know, this where and, the, uh, and what pathways, uh, the fact that in the brain there are neurons which are activated by uh, multisensory signals. This was not uh, clear at that, that, that time, it was not known. And we have moved from geometric shapes to actions. Uh, you remember I was talking about model-based vision. Then, you know, people discovered neurons that uh, uh, code uh, the shape of the objects uh, uh, according to how they grasp the object. Uh, so the shape, uh, our brain uh, has an anthropometric geometry, not a, 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 not a, a, a geometric geometry. So a chair, the concept of a chair is, a sh uh, is an action, is not a shape. You know, that was not clear in 1989. Uh, we, we, we interpret the other using uh, the knowledge of our own body. These mirror neurons, uh, these really are a quintessential ingredients of embodiment. Uh, to understand the others, you need to use the information your brain has to move your body. You know? So this, this, I think, uh, uh, was, uh, at least uh, uh, in terms of building artificial system, was, uh, was a big, uh, big step forward. Uh, the other thing we learn is that the brain is not a collection of statically interconnected maps, you know, like it was depicted, uh, you know, uh, in 1991 and even before. But, you know, uh, we, we have started uh, uh, to discover that the brain is, uh, uh, you know, the network, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, reorganized according to the task. Uh, some areas in the brain are shared uh, for different tasks. So this... Uh, this is another important information if you if you are interested in building systems and, and studying the architecture of, of the systems. Uh, so, I mean, uh, the robot bodies have increased. You know, this uh, Hopping uh, 1981 by, by Mark Raybert is now Atlas. And, and I don't have to, to explain how fantastic, uh, how a fantastic machine this is. On the other hand, uh, we still communicate uh, using uh, uh, the language of the technology. We still don't, uh, our systems still do not understand very much. You know, and, and that is, uh, 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 that is something which we missed. And, you know, the other thing that I understood that I learned is that intelligence is not assembled, you know, like a car, but it has to develop, uh, you know. And, and, and here you have to keep in mind that, you know, this idea of uh, development uh, is still limited by the fact that the materials that we are using are still not the kind of materials we would like to have, even if there are research going in, in, in that direction. So what else? Uh, we have done very well in real time, you know, but we have realized that the key problem for robotics is, uh, is anticipation, you know. So moving from action uh, perception, uh, you know, to a different kind of loop, you know, exploration and prediction. You always have in mind what you are going to experience in the next second. You know, how do you do that? How does your brain do that? You know, this, this is an important, we have to go beyond real time, you know. And, and one stream of research is related to a simulation of movements, you know, like uh, 
the mental simulation theory, which was supposed by Marc Janerot. Our system have to be able not only to move, but to imagine uh, the effect of the movement uh, motorically and sensorially. I mean, this is something which is, uh, which, is, uh, which is there to be discovered. We have done very well in learning, but, but uh, uh, and we know that, you know, I know that deep learning has uh, uh, some role in the makeup of intelligence, but there are still uh, very big uh, limits, you know. Causality is not uh, addressed very well, and, you know, generalization and transfer is also another weak point uh, of the learning system that we have. So uh, I have this idea of a Swiss Army knife approach. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because, I mean, if it, this is a good idea, then it, you, you cannot really build an intelligent system by, by assembling uh, different behaviors. Maybe, maybe we are trying to learn evolution uh, instead of uh, uh, considering the fact that uh, our ability to adapt uh, uh, is the result of evolution, development, and learning. So there are many ingredients there that have to be considered. Uh, so we have built fantastic bodies and, and implemented a lot of individual skills, you know, learning. Uh, uh, we have learned a lot using the ICA, but we say we, all the world has, has progressed a lot in, in, in those in, uh, kind of individual learning. But this does not scale, as, as I was saying. I mean, it does not scale. We need to share uh, the architecture. We need to share a reference. Uh, uh, where people can uh, contribute their own individual um, uh, skills, their own individual improvements of, of the body. We, we need this, uh, this, this architecture. So I think this, this is one of the missing parts. The other part is that also we need to go beyond uh, biomimetism uh, or the simple way of biomimetism, you know, and, and Paolo has, has talked about, uh, about that also very, very clearly. We don't have to stop to, to describe, to build system to describe uh, 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 biological systems, but also to build uh, um, robots to explain, you know, to demonstrate the principles. Uh, and only in this way you can think of finding new technologies. There is no other way in my about that. So to build more intelligence robot, we need to better understand ourselves. And I want to, to, to mention the sentence by, by Tommy Poggio in a recent workshop, uh, uh, where he says that I think the past tell us that several of the advances of, in, of uh, intelligence will come from neuroscience. And I still believe that uh, very much. So we need to put a model of the human in our robots. Otherwise, they will not interact with us. You know. Even a car, I mean, you don't need to think about humanoids. I mean, an autonomous car has to have a model of a human if uh, the car has to drive safely around, around us. So that's, uh, uh, that's uh, the, the, the challenge in front of us, you know, the, the, the fact that the academia need to nurture the formation of an extended research community. And when I say uh, a, a, a community, I, I don't mean uh, organizing multidisciplinary workshops. I mean, really people working together in the same room, uh, you know, and, and that is, uh, so maybe, uh, you know, as, as, a last, uh, as a last suggestion, I mean, maybe uh, we have to think about uh, the extended version of the zoo that, that uh, Rodney Brooks put together uh, a few years ago. And, and, uh, and, and, and with that, you know, just uh, summarizing, uh, what I've said so far, you know, we have done a lot on the technological components of our robots uh, uh, and progressed a lot on the understanding of uh, the aspects of human intelligence. But today, I think we have failed to develop autonomous robotic systems. Uh, and then and, and, and in fact, you know, the only mass produced uh, robot so far is, uh, is Roomba and we have to thank uh, Rodney Brooks for that. However, I'm convinced that uh, we are in a much better shape uh, now than, than 30 years uh, than 30 years uh, ago. And you know, good luck uh, for the next 30. And uh, as a conclusion, happy birthday, my friends. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Giulio, for uh, this uh, fantastic journey we had. Uh, Last 40 years of robotics and our life and research, uh, we were and we are uh, perfectly on time, I would say. So now I I take 
the responsibility of uh, sort of coordinating the first uh, uh, set of uh, contributions. Actually, Cecilia and Giulio were able to uh, have 19 persons participate, who participated in, uh, in the meeting El Choco. And uh, so all of those, uh, uh, as you see, in fact, are colleagues and friends, and we are proud and happy that they were able to join us. So I would like to ask uh, in, in the order, I, I'm, I'm taking the responsibility, as Julia said, about uh, body wear, let's say, and mind wear, however, because there is no body with my, without mind, but also, and Julia will talk about mind wear and body wear. This was the, the trick, if you will. So, uh, and uh, I, I would like to invite uh, uh, Atsu Takanishi first. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have too much time, uh, all, all friends, and so we ask you one minute or so, one minute possibly, uh, sharp points uh, on uh, what happened in these uh, 30 years uh, according to your vision. Atsu, from Tokyo, in real okay. time. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Atsu. Thank you. Uh, congratulations for the fantastic meeting uh, uh, and your, your birthday. Uh, I, I <laughs> personally uh, don't have enough time to prepare for my presentation here today. Because in Japan, no need, no need for presentation. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So what happened over the last thirty years? Uh, I uh, my 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 personal history. Uh, I I really eager to uh, make uh, uh, our technology related, especially uh, on human robots uh to be applicable to the society so i work together with many uh companies because you know uh, socialization only can be done uh the collaboration between us and the uh, uh companies which can uh produce a robot as a commercial product so uh I worked together with Sony. Uh, they, uh, in the beginning, they had a plan to sell uh, the robot, not only dog type, but also humanoid type. That's uh, much smaller than human size, uh, as a sort, uh, sort of, uh, of uh, entertainment purpose. Uh, but unfortunately, Sony is, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, economical situation uh, was not good. So finally, uh, uh, the president of the company uh, uh, was uh, kicked out. Then uh, the uh, human project uh, uh, also shut, shut down. Uh, but uh, they, uh, some of them moved move to Toyota. And the Toyota, uh, uh, you know, succeeded to uh, realize a sort of human robots, especially a serial entertainment purpose in, in the 2005. Uh, it's uh, IT uh, ex, um, Expo, and they developed uh, several types of musical player robots. And then they, uh, after that, they moved to realize more you know, uh, useful or uh, commercialization direction. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, Toyota's interest uh, is uh, changed a little bit, uh, not to robot, but to AI. Uh, so they uh, built a AI research center in, in the US. So uh, still there are a lot of uh, problems. Uh, uh, Toyota case and Sony case are just a uh, short and um, small part of my collaboration between companies. So 
about uh, 20 years ago, uh, we had a, we started the collaboration uh, with uh, with a medical education. I don't know how to say. Uh, you know, in in medicine, uh, there are a lot of skills. People need to be skilled a lot uh, in order to cure uh, people. Uh, like, like today, uh, uh, COVID nineteen, uh, uh, especially in uh, education purpose. So we started the development to develop not the full uh, full humanoid, but uh, some part of humanoid, such as upper body uh, for airway management. Uh, it has a lot of sensors and some actuators. Uh, and uh, it gives you a, a sort of uh, scores that how uh, your your uh, skills uh, can be evaluated uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know uh, field application uh, applicable to the real uh, cases. Uh, before or, or still now, uh, uh, people in the medicine uh, are teaching. Uh, uh, them each other, uh, you know, all human, uh, hu human base. I don't know how to say. It. Uh, but uh, gradually, uh, this idea uh, uh, becomes popular. So I could see some uh, real cases, like my. Was, of course, some of them are already uh, uh, went into the market, and uh, I am uh, quite happy about that. So. Humanoid technology in the still not fully <laughs> applicable to the society, but uh, uh, this is one uh, success uh, on me. Sorry for um, uh, my taking time <laughs> for, for long. Uh, that's my 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 uh, just comment about my uh, thirty years of uh, history. So very well. Okay. So industry and society. Thank you mm, very much. Yeah. Our next speaker is uh, Toshi, Toshi Fukuda. Are you there, Toshi? You connected, otherwise we move. Uh... Hello, hey. Oh, hello, Toshi. Ciao. Hello. Ciao, <laughs> ciao. Fantastic, Toshi. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> Okay. okay, so 30 years after the Il Choco meeting, what is the heritage? What is your opinion? What is needed? What you have done in two minutes? Uh, okay, okay. You just yeah. Uh, share. Yeah, we can hear. Share, share, share. Can you give me a. I want to share. Yeah, okay. Yes. I want to show something to you. Share. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can you hear? Can you see me? Can you see the video? Can you see the PowerPoint? Can you see the PowerPoint? No. Hello. Yes, hey. can, yes we can see it. Oh, you can see that. That's great. That I want to show. <laughs> okay. This is a. Yes, yes, we can, can see. <laughs> ah, that's great. Fantastic. Great. Yes. Yes. This is just one year before Iruchaka. Yes. It, I just had a IROS 1988 in Tokyo. This is a home party at home. It's just over more than 30 years ago. Paolo, you are here. I, I see myself. George, 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 and Julia here. Yeah. <laughs> Mark here. <yeah. laughs> That's great. Everybody have a here, okay? <laughs> black somewhere be black here. <laughs> that I want to show this picture. Ready? So can you see the picture? Yeah, I think it was the 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 party for a girl. The is right? holiday no. in Japan? I think I, I don't remember. Anyhow, no, yeah. this is just a kind of party at, at Iros. Eating a lot, yes. Iros, Iros party, yes. 
Yes, so, go on. Yes. So, that's, you know, that's I will show this picture. So, just I want to talk about such something like a cyborg and the bionic system. Uh, In two minutes, Satoshi. Oh, no, sure. Well, what happened? It doesn't work well, but they did. I will show this one and uh, uh, one one zero. No, it doesn't work. But for slide is doesn't. Can you see the video, such a picture? No, can you see? Yes. Yeah. So go on. Okay. Yeah. Okay, go this forward. is a picture, and I want to show, I work about such a kind of a the uh, integer robot, and then I work with uh, such a kind of brackation robot. Then I work with, uh, ooh, slide, slide doesn't work. Slide show, slide show. Slide show doesn't work. Okay. So anyway, I work with those things, brackation and the hybrid system, and then, I, I like such a kind, more like such a kind of bio uh, based thing. So we work with such a kind of uh, artificial uh, robot from the modular robot. Modular robot makes a more complex system. And I understand those things. Now I try to make it more such a hybrid with such a kind of uh, biological system and uh, such artificial uh, system. It called hybrid system, like a cyborg. And I started with a cyborg system, a cyborg and a bionic system. And uh, a part, uh, I like this kind of three stage. One stage, kind of device level, based on the bio, biological cell. Second stage is going to make kind of such, such a, a more like a kind of device here, based on such a kind of cell. Then we can make a system. We can make a system. So that's nice to uh, make those here. So anyway, this is uh, something, and I think that you don't see the, my my video, my my picture. Can you see my picture? No, I mean no. kind of a photo. Yeah, the picture, yes, of the party, but no, yeah. no, no other slides. No more no slides. Slide. No more slides. Okay, something wrong here. Anyway, doesn't matter. It's a Microsoft. Okay, doesn't. Anyway, that's a good thing, and I work with such a kind of a, uh, more like a cell based system and uh, try to make a 3D a assembly uh, from the cells. So that's a, it, my work. I try to make a, such a kind of blood vein to make a scalable biological system. So that, that's working on and try to make more and more such a complicated system. And try to make a kind of a, uh, such a in vivo system from uh, uh, from uh, laboratories. So that's a kind of uh, work you on. And uh, Paolo, I work together with such a kind of a cyborg robotic system conference uh, together to uh, make a, such a kind of progress. I hope. Uh, this you are you are also working in those areas in EMBS and Robotic Automation Society in OITP, and I'm very happy. You know, I think you will make more uh, wonderful such a kind of uh, uh, achievement even after you after this party. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Toshi. Thank you. Actually. Uh, even if we were not able to see his slides, you know, we were impressed, for example, by his brachiation robot. He made a, a robot like a monkey. You know, this was the first in the world. And this was one of the reasons we decided to invite you, you know, Julio and I and uh, Patrick Abisher. And uh, then uh, he is working very much on cyborg. And he became the president of the IEEE. Uh, 500,000 uh, members worldwide. So Toshi honored uh, uh, our community very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Toshi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank by you. the way, such a brachiation robot was inspired by uh, Mark Rayburn's son. 
because he will copy copy robot. Copy, yes, he's exactly. a copy robot. I mean, then, such a broadcast. Uh, exactly. It was same, like in a sense of uh, such a limit cycle. And I yes. like such a stability too. It was an extremely uh, creative uh, period for uh, all of us. And we really communicated a lot, uh, you know, we were inspired uh, by our colleagues and friends. Thank you very much, uh, Toshi. We move to Rodney Brooks. Rodney, are you there? I, I am here. I see that Toshi is yes, still man. sharing his screen. Oh, so the, uh, yeah. So, I so I, 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 I want to talk about not a success, but about failure. Okay. Can people hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in my, in, in, in my paper from the bionics workshop, uh, it was about robot beings. And the, and the point was, how are we going to build robots that exist in the world and operate in the world in the way that animals do and have an ongoing existence? And as uh, Julio pointed out, the, the closest we've come is the Roomba. Uh, and there are 35 million of those out there. Um, and they sit and they wait till they're a certain time they come out, they clean, they go back home, and some of them even empty their uh, dirt bag. But it's nothing like what we, what we were imagining back in 1989 for a robot that would live in the world and operate in the world totally autonomously. We just haven't figured out how to do that. And uh, in, my, in my worst days, I blame it all on Ross, uh, where academics uh, perceive the world and build models of the world in 3D and, and uh, uh, have completely lost the uh, ideas that Julio was talking about how action is so important. So we have to remember action is important. Ongoing existence is a dream and we have failed to get there after 30 some years, but we'll keep trying. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodney. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, as, as Rodney said, uh, is uh, you know, 35 million Roomba in the world. That is a really deployment of uh, science and technology. Thank you very much by all our community. And then we move to uh, Mark, Mark Raber, another inspiring figure. Mark, did you remember our discussion in Tokyo where when you were uh, thinking about leaving MIT? and creating Boston Dynamics, you know, we had a dinner in Tokyo and you were excitating. But then here you are, one of the leading figures in the world in uh, robotics, in dynamics. So can you tell us <laughs> story <laughs> and your perception of the future? Thanks. Yeah, I thought about talking about that, that uh, event for me which was basically, I don't know if you know, but my plan was to quit robotics. And when I left MIT and started Boston Dynamics, Boston Dynamics wasn't doing robotics for 10 years and not until, um, I can't remember the year, 2004 or something. So we'd been, you know, we were found, I founded the company in 1992. So I was quitting robotics, believe it or not. But that was stupid because I love robotics. And uh, all the things that were true at the meeting in 1989, you know, many of them are true today. Um, one was the inspiration that biology provides for robotics. I know that's, we're not, I'm not talking about biorobotics, I'm just talking about robotics, I guess. But the, the inspiration of what people and animals can do, still far beyond uh, what robots can do, has been a consistent theme for me and, uh, you know, our company even as we try and build practical, uh, you know, manufacturable machines. Another thread that runs through is the need for functionality, the focus on functionality, not so much form, uh, not so much even maybe the method, but what's the functionality? And by, by functionality, I mean mobility, the ability to move in a world which is often unstructured, dexterity, the ability to handle things in the world when the things uh, and the world are unstructured and perception, which kind of is one of the pieces of glue that makes it all work together. I think in the 30 years or the 31 years since the meeting, uh, that focus, the need for the focus on that functionality hasn't changed. We've made a lot of progress in, in many areas, but um, uh, there's more to be done. Um, I think one thing that has changed for me 
is I'm not so optimistic that biological hardware uh, should influence robot hardware. I mean, we're building more and more complex machines that can do more and more things that look like biology, but all the methods and the technology and the design, uh, although they obey the same physics as uh, biological systems, they're really a lot different. And I'm not optimistic that anytime soon we're going to uh, use the methods of biology for uh, for robot hardware design. Um, I guess one last thing that's been a new thing just for me is, uh, you know, some of you may have seen our robots dancing. Uh, dancing is a funny thing because it doesn't really, the key isn't those functionalities of mobility, dexterity, and perception, even though it uses the results of all that in order to do expression, it's an opportunity to be creative, and it really connects with people um, who are watching. And, uh, you know, that's kind of an interesting flavor. What do we need to do to make robots uh, acceptable uh, to normal people? Uh, you know, all you have to do is get on the Internet and you can find people on every side of that question. And so it's kind of a fun new thing uh, to be thinking about. Thank you. Happy birthday, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. The, the privilege. And uh, while Massimo Vegamasco is coming here, just uh, uh, two comments, actually, uh, based on what you said. Uh, MIT has been uh, a, a place where people have really explored different things. So you are, have mentioned that when you moved to Boston Dynamics, they were not working in robotics, in fact, but you then went back to robotics. There are other people like uh, Tomas Lozano Perez, for, for example, who moved uh, uh, a, a fantastic uh, uh, leader in kinematics, uh, and uh, he left uh, for uh, the simulation in biology, but then he's back to robotics. You know, this kind of uh, 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 movement from uh, one field to another is one of the uh, most exciting uh, uh, feature of, of robotics. And uh, uh, so thank you for pointing out uh, these and indicating some lines. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Massimo. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Happy birthday, first of all. <laughs> thank and you. Uh, it's an honor for me to be uh, only after 30 years, but uh, because, um, you know, the, the, thank you. No, no, please stay. And um, such an inspiring people and uh, top, and also on this uh, very interesting topic like uh, bionics, which is a complex topic. You know, I, I was in the Ichoko, the workshop at Ichoko uh, 32 years ago, and uh, as I have uh, described in the short presentation that I sent to Ariana and Cecilia, um, I, uh, at that time I was presenting something on non-conventional actuators, do you remember, Paolo? We were working about with the uh, shape memory alloys, you know. And uh, after 30 years, in, in the presentation, I've shown again, you know, other type of results of the research with other type of uh, actuators, you know, because that is something that uh, it, it has been said before, you know, the research is still an open question, an open problem, you know. You mentioned the fact that uh, we are uh, developing uh, artificial entities, artificial um, uh, artificial beings, you know. And I think that uh, as a mechanical engineer, I'm interested clearly on the body. However, on the physical aspects, however, however, clearly an entity, even artificial entity should have also sensation perception, action, which is something mental, I, feel, I believe, as well as uh, cons consciousness. I don't know what it will bring uh, our research. But in any case, uh, the aspect of uh, uh, mechanics, for example, is something that should be addressed in terms of uh, research also with other disciplines. You know, For example, if we study perception today, a good trend is that of uh, trying to understand neurobiology and computer science together. 
And uh, this is something that should be taken into account. You mentioned it also before, uh, Giulio, that it is interesting, it will be very important to bring people of different disciplines to work together in the future in order to increase the level of knowledge in this field. I hope uh, that my work and the work of the people working in our new Institute of Mechanical Intelligence could help in order to erase, to avoid the, the dualism between uh, scientific disciplines and humanities, you know, in the future. So I think that this is uh, something that should be taken into account uh, when uh, we will uh, teach people to start a new topic like this one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Massimo. Thank you. And uh, now we we move to Ken, our friend Ken Salisbury. There, Ken. Connected. Yes. Thank you. We cannot hear you, however. No, we cannot hear you. Uh, okay. No, maybe you are muted or? Uh, not muted. Um, okay, now, now it's okay, fine. Now we can hear you. Okay, we're, we're good. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some design concepts. Um, a lot of them ultimately relate to human robot interaction. Uh, this is something uh, haptic, haptic interface I built before they were called haptic interfaces. Um, it was used cables to have low friction um, and uh, was inspired by people who some of you know, Tony Batesy from JPL, um, who very much wanted a generalized haptic interface for controlling ro remote robots. Uh, to, um, uh, Jean Berthu from the French Atomic, uh, Atomic Energy Commission uh, taught me quite a bit about using cables and why they, they could give you back drivability and high efficiency transmission. Um, I have a number of slides, so I'm going to zoom through these. Um, one of the more interesting robots we developed, and this is around the time of the conference, was the WAM robot. Um, WAM meant whole arm manipulator. And the original concept was that it would touch people. It was designed to be physically interactive and back drivable, uh, sufficiently back drivable that it, uh, the impact forces would be very low. Um, and it was passively back drivable. There are no sensors to detect, uh, such as a wrist force sensor. Um, the transmission was clean, uh, back drivable, low, uh, low friction, and uh, I'm not going to worry about the cabling. It was interesting cabling. Um, this is an interesting video that was produced by uh, Jean-Jacques uh, Jean uh, Slatin, Gunter Niemeyer, and let's see if we can make it work. So this is the WAM robot. There are, oh, there are cameras up at the top watching, a, and the vision was simply color keying. So, Vision was easy. We had to have black screening everywhere. Um, and uh, originally it was designed to have physical interaction with the world, but the bandwidth that was necessary to do that ultimately turned out to mean that the robot could be very fast. Um, that's since been commercialized by Bill Townsend over the last 30 years, ranging from a medical robot uh, to now a rehabilitation robot. Uh, and again it, again, it implies those same back drivability characteristics uh, that make it good for physical contact with humans. Um, we designed uh, haptic interfaces, which again, physical interfaces with people, um, and those since have been commercialized. In instead of being thousands of dollars, this one on the right is $2,000 and um, has been is used in a lot of laboratories. Um, we did work on surgical robotics. This technology um, was ultimately um, incorporated with intuitive surgical. Um, my most 
an invention that I'm most proud of was a the ripper, the uh, human interface to this, which um, had four degrees of freedom. Typically, you get gimbal lock if you only have three degrees of freedom, but by adding a fourth uh, degree of freedom, you have now had a homogeneous solution, so you can move the joints away from their um, stops or best condition the uh, orientation of it. Um, this is the first the first version of the PR2. This is the PR1, and the the video that sold this to um, Willow Garage is this video. This is eight times speed up. First PR. This is teleoperated. Uh, there's human in the loop, but if physically look at the things that it can do. I think this is still a challenge uh, for researchers and developers uh, yet to come to exploit that kind of dexterity. Um, that was commercialized. Uh, PR2, many of you know about this robot. One of the things I think is very important is having um, platforms that people can share and co-develop so that we can build on each other. It went and got me coffee one day. It took, had to go through three uh, floors, through elevators, um, stop for uh, collision with people. Um, down at the bottom, it had to feel its way to find the knob uh, the handle to open the door um, because the glass made vision difficult. Um, and finally, human robot interaction, um, in particular, wearable robotics, I think is something that we're going to see a lot more of. You know, our, our relationships with robots have mostly been visual, watching them. Um, the human robot community is starting to have emotional or affective interactions. Um, Harry Assad has done some terrific work. Uh, at MIT in powered exoskeletons. Um, I think that's going to come, but the problem is that it takes a lot of weight for the motors and the batteries. And uh, so we looked at the low end, something you could wear that would be a physical apparatus that could simply stabilize objects in front of you. And um, uh, we looked for real world applications so we could commercialize it. Um, that That didn't happen. I think there are still places uh, for application with wearable robotics in the most simple uh, configuration. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. I think, oh yeah, this is an interesting movie. Th this is teleoperated, but here's one of our imaginings of a person working and the robot anticipates or is guided by vision or voice control um, to bring a person a tool and then retract itself and be out of the way. And again, this is going for simplicity and minimal physical capability just to fit the technical capability. I, I hope someday, um, this is a festival I went to. <laughs> um, I, I hope someday um, we have superconducting motors. Um, and uh, I've always been frustrated, like uh, computing power has gone up exponentially uh, while motors have gone up in quality linearly. So I hope we have some big jump in motors, which would make a huge difference. And with that, uh, I am done. I'm sorry if I've taken a little too much time, uh, but thank you very much and, and happy birthday. Thank you very much, Ken. Thanks you. <clears throat> really, as, as we all know, uh, Ken is one of the most talented mechanical engineers in, in robotics and uh, still uh, showing uh, this talent uh, in the many implementations he has done most famous, uh, the Da Vinci robot, I would say. Thank you very much, Ken. And now we have Antonio, Antonio Bicchi. Hello, hi. Hello, Antonio. Happy birthday, Paolo. It's a great Thank pleasure to be much. here to listen to uh, uh, the colleagues and your great introduction and, and Julius and everybody. So what we presented, uh, I, I went back to the proceedings. I didn't quite remember. I. I I found out that in, uh, in, in the Choco, we presented uh, Gabriele Basura, a paper on whole hand inflation. Uh, it's quite fit that I speak after uh, Ken, because it was actually Ken first did the hand and then he did the whole arm manipulator. So we simply did the whole hand manipulator. It's kind of building on the, you know, on the shoulders of, of, of the giants, really. But, uh, uh, 
above that, I think we uh, introduced the idea of uh, uh, using all parts of the hand. And that was an anthropomorphic design that uh, reasoned about the fact that uh, humans use all of their hands to have simpler and more effective grasping and manipulation. While at the time, robot hands only had uh, uh, fingertip manipulation. Those were the, the glorious times where uh, we uh, analysis was popular. And uh, we realized that uh, whole hands, uh, although they were uh, simpler to use, they needed more complex analysis uh, because of the new constraints. So at that time, I, I think I learned the first lesson that was uh, simple is not easy. And that is where we need to go. Uh, to do simpler things, we need to, to work harder to understand better and more. Uh, another thing I we learned since then is that uh, constraints coming from the body pose challenges to analysis and intelligence that to me means understanding, which eventually, however, do not limit, but rather limit, or the same word, define the intelligence and eventually empower it. So it is the really, it's really the body, uh, to come to the topic of this discussion, it is really the body that defines and gives the boundaries of intelligence and therefore if you want to study and understand intelligence, you have to, to work with the, the body web and understand and implement. These ideas were part of the baggage uh, that I brought with me in years to come. And uh, even when my motivations and goals have shifted in time from more curiosity driven research to uh, now making robots that uh, should be, in my vision, usable and useful to, to people, the same concept remained there. Understand the biological example, realize that intelligence is not just information technology, rather it is interaction technology, and that it is the future of AI to me, and that the road towards simplicity is difficult, but the view from the top will be worth it. Thank you, Paolo, at Mayora. <laughs> Thank you very much, Antonio. While Danilo De Rossi is joining us, I would like to observe that uh, quite uh, understandably, all of uh, those who participated in the workshop at Il Choco got very, very successful positions in academia, industry, and so on. Very interesting to follow and as an inspiration to our young colleagues and students. In that time we as you have seen from julio's video and toshi's picture we were really very very young and you refer to cecilia So good afternoon to everybody and obviously to Paul. Uh, my point is a little bit aside, but I come back to what Julio said about <clears throat> uh, mechanical engineers, computer scientists. I would add uh, control engineers and electronics as being the main driver beside bioscience. I found myself in a niche. In fact, I'm not a roboticist in that class. I'm a material scientist applied material scientists. I try to do this in uh, several examples. From my point of view, obviously not much has changed from the early times. Why? Simply because the merge between material science, obviously I will specify what I mean in this context, and the other discipline has been almost non-existent. I would say bionics could mean bioelectronic, but could also mean Bioionics, which is our bodies, animal body are made of ion conductor, non-electronic conductor. Soft robotics is coming lately, and obviously <clears throat> we have here a good example, Cecilia and others. I started soft robotics myself before 89. I don't mean this for claiming anything. What I mean is 
really what we are doing here in term bionics has been great, but it's been only a follow up of advances in computer science, electronic engineers, mechanics and control. So the true bionics, if it means, if it has many sense, has not, in my opinion, that started marginally. And I found it very difficult, as I think Mark Ryber says, because if you are an engineer, you want to like components which work, which are reliable. We give you at least the chance of making a meaningful experiments. So you buy on the shelf what? Torque motors, sensors, actuators, and computer, and vision, and camera. To do really bionics in a sense of a strong sense, I would call strong bionics and weak bionics. Strong bionics is far away even to start. And I don't know if we'll ever start since the progress of other computer science and mechanics and has been so, so great that it's really killing any patient that hope, in my opinion, I hope I'm wrong for making really uh, changing the paradigm to material ionics and whatever else, which make really flesh-like artificial robotics. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniele. Thank you. Actually, we are really uh, on time. So thank all, uh, thanks to all the speakers. Just one point is that, you know, at the time of the workshop in Choco, you were really almost the, one, the only one about materials. Yeah, no, while today I would say the material uh, area is uh, really getting into robotics. Uh, so in a sense, it was a pioneering uh, contribution that is now getting uh, credibility and, and room. But your point is very well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we move uh, perfectly on time to the next part. Uh, what I'd like to ask, uh, according to our director of activity, Cecilia, uh, please uh, open all your uh, cameras so that uh, uh, direction can, yeah, a screenshot of all of us. Could you do that kindly so that we can take a picture. While you do this, uh, the floor to go about talking about mind way and body way <laughs> reversing. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, thanks, Paolo, and, and thank you very much to all people who actually have uh, uh, contributed so far. I mean, the, the reason why we we divided in two was mostly in two sessions, well, mostly for practical reasons, because as I was uh, saying in one of my first slides, I think that uh, within bionics, at least, uh, body and, and mind uh, cannot be really separated. So we decided uh, to, to, make, me. to make two sessions, uh, uh, well, more or less uh, centered uh, uh, one or centered in the other, but for example, uh, you know, Roddy uh, Brooks has, have con has contributed uh, as much uh, in building robots uh, as in, you know, understanding and, and studying intelligence uh, as, uh, you know, Ken and, uh, and Antonio and Danilo, you know, almost everybody. So the second set of, of, uh, uh, of uh, contributors is, is more based on, on uh, sort of, you know, mindware, but uh, uh, so this the distinction is, is artificial, as I was saying. So uh, I, I know uh, Piero is uh, uh, Piero Morasso is uh, is connected. Uh, so yes, sir. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. We don't see you. I see Concetta, but I don't see Pietro Morasso. Camera is open. I, I don't know. Camera what is, is open. Maybe it's uh, okay. Now you are on. Okay. Now we okay. hear you and we see you. Okay. Oh, Go ahead. Oh, is, yes. is, uh, is one of the of the you know uh, masters of most for for me and, and for Paolo. So, Piero. Well, uh, first of all, uh, a happy birthday and um, congratulations for the many successes that you uh, um, 
told about uh, during these uh, 30 years. Uh, however, I'm not so, uh, so optimistic uh, as you are. Maybe, you know, when you uh, become a little bit more uh, uh, older than uh, you are, then you tend to see that, ah, uh, oh, yes, uh, the older time were uh, much better than uh, are going to be next one. But uh, I, I really uh, don't think that uh, in uh, the future, bionics by itself uh, could be a, uh, a main player. And uh, there are many reasons. One was already summarized by uh, Daniel De Rossi before, but uh, uh, even more, uh, the, the, the comments uh, formulated by Rodney Brooks and, uh, and Mark Rebert uh, about robotics um, clarify that uh, actually uh, we are very far away to uh, having the capability and uh, the understanding, the scientific understanding of uh, we can do for uh, uh, for having really intelligent robots and uh, from this point of view i uh, uh, think that we need to go back to the idea uh, that in order to to have a, a robot that can uh, interact in a significant manner with humans you must understand better neuroscience, uh, both motor uh, neuroscience and the cognitive uh, neuroscience, in, uh, in the sense that what is really uh, lacking nowadays is a, a, a science and a, a, an application and engineering of cognitive robotics. And this is really, um, uh, and there is also one, one, one comment by uh, Mark Rabert. He said that uh, for having uh, advanced robots, you don't uh, maybe need to have uh, uh, robotic hardware that uh, emulates uh, or simulate uh, biological hardware. I agree, uh, because uh, bodywear can be also different uh, in a sense. You, you can put in uh, advanced robot uh, some capabilities that uh, humans don't have and uh, uh, vice versa. But uh, what is really needed uh, that is now uh, lacking is uh, a um, biological cognitive uh, capability. And this is um, uh, essential, particularly for the, the, the applications that will, will be funded and pushed by Industry 4.0, where the interaction between humans and, uh, and uh, robots uh, become the, the uh, real problem. So I, uh, I think that the, the real um, um, future of bionics could be something like uh, bio-inspired cognitive robotics. This is my opinion. Maybe it's biased, but uh, this is more or less what I think for the next, uh, for, for the uh, people of the next generation, not mine, of course. Okay, thanks. thanks Happy Piero. birthday again. Thanks, thanks Piero. Yes. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Yes, there is always this struggle between the materials uh, and, and, you know, biological hardware and, and, uh, and artificial hardware, which are two different worlds, uh, by the way. So that's, that's uh, always nice to, to point out. So uh, we move uh, now to Neville Hogan, uh, who is uh, also an, uh, one of the main contributors to the parallel between control and biological systems uh, since many years. Uh, and, uh, please, Neville, if you want to share the screen. Okay, you are so, on now. Yeah, very good. Uh, thank you. So I guess, uh, first of all, I appreciate being invited to participate in this event, and I really appreciated being invited to participate in the event 30, whatever it was, years ago. Uh, at that time, I was working on the problem of trying to understand how to control contact and physical interaction. And I have to confess that I haven't made much progress. I'm still working on the same, the same topic, which turned out to be quite hard. Um, my sense is that one of the things that, that I think has, at least in my perception, has emerged is that there is a, a very useful convergence of robotics and, and uh, biology, that is, I've said this uh, several times that in in uh, in developing robots, you quickly identify problems, things that don't work, 
in, uh, in, in biology, you see solutions, but you might not know what problems they were, they were addressing because the systems had the problems that evolved out of the gene pool. And so the combination can give you a lot of new insight. One of the things that I've been really struck by in the intervening decades is uh, how it's what I call the paradox of human performance. Humans are spectacularly good, despite the fact that they've got terrible hardware. Well, I mean, we, you know, neural communication is 100 meters a second. That's pathetic. Brains are slow. I mean, there's the Shepard Metzler uh, experiment on asking humans to identify uh, whether two objects were congruent or not. Take something like one second plus one second for 60 degrees of rotation. That's terrible. Now, you know, ro robotic hardware has improved. I and mean, you saw some of Mark Rabbit's uh, robots, and those are, those are impressive. And robotic uh, computers have improved exponentially. So, uh, and yet at the same time, humans still, at, at least in the area of, of dexterity, humans still vastly outperform uh, robots. So, what's the trick? I, I don't know the answer, but I think that that, is, that raises a, an important uh, question. It's not obvious to me that um, the way that humans control behavior is going to be the way that robots will control behavior. But I think that the more we know about how it's done, the more we can be able to identify what are the critical components. And I have to say, I, uh, if, if Ken, uh, Ken, I completely agree with you that, in my view, the actuator is the key limitation, and I wish we had better ones. Not that muscles are perfect. But they have great back drivability and great uh, force to weight ratio and all those nice things. But uh, I, you know, I, my sense is that what I was struck by when I when I went back to look at the the, the, the book from thirty years ago is that I think there was a lot of uh, prescience in uh, emphasizing this convergence of robotics, biology, biology and science and, and robotics, and I think that that was uh, quite remarkable. So congratulations and happy birthday, Paul. Thank you, Neville. Thank you. Th thanks, Neville. Thank you very much. Um, Sandro Musaibaldi. Sandro. Oh, hi. Can uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, very well. Okay. Thanks. Very well. Thank you. Uh, so if I, since we are talking about optimism and pessimism, I like to quote a, a major uh, Italian historic figure was Antonio Gramsci that said that one has to have the, the, the pessimism of reason and the optimism of the will. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Paolo has been really instrumental to the whole, not just robotic community, I think it goes beyond, uh, to the concept of building uh, uh, technology uh, continuing to be dreaming of the future. And, and when I think about the future and the, and the fiction, in the fiction, I think about, uh, there are two, two movies that, are, uh, that I have in mind. One, of course, is 2001 uh, by Kubrick. And the other is a more recent uh, movie. Uh, the name is Robot and Frank. I, I think that the, the common feature of those movies is that the image of robotics of the future is mostly based on the concept, on the communication between the biology of the human in this case and the machine on the other side. And, uh, and that is what the level of communication in the fiction is what really gives the perception of, of the future, something that is not there yet, but we are moving toward. And, uh, and when you talk about communication, of course, there is the verbal communication, but there is also the non-verbal communication. And, uh, and the other thing that I think is, is part of the focus that uh, is, is part of what I'm interested in, but also so many other people, is the, the interaction between uh, two forms of learning, the human learning uh, and the machine learning on the other side. And uh, uh, the idea that those two interacting elements are interacting, forming uh, models of so representation of each other. And uh, models came from being simply kind of a, a, a general uh, concept, uh, um, if you want, a, a philosophical concept, is now more seen as um, really something that can be conceptualized as a state, as a state of learning. So you have a state of learning of the machine and a state of learning of uh, 
uh, of the human. And I think that that's, uh, that is a perspective that I found uh, uh, interesting in uh, how things are developing. I, I think that's all what I have to say so far. Thanks, Thank Sandro. Very much. Pino? <laughs> Giuseppe, sorry, Pino is Giuseppe Casalino. <laughs> I, uh, Pino is for friends, and <laughs> friends. One of the historic friends. Good afternoon, good morning to everybody. And thank you so much to Paolo. Also, nice birthday and to, and, and to Giulio for inviting me here to this renaissance of the old workshop of, of Ichok. Well, actually from uh, my background in robotics, mainly on, uh, everybody may be known, mainly from control, mainly from cooperative control of robots and so on. And at that time, I've been very glad to have the possibility of, uh, let's say, putting my that time background on control just for trying to make possible the new actuator that Danilo De Rossi was developing as a pioneering work, give them an harmonic behavior to put them together in such a way that they could cooperate and to control an arm instead that with normal DC motor with different actuator and with the possibility of not only have a redundancy in the arm and in the structure, but also redundancy in the actuation. Well, simulation were encouraging at that time uh, and the technology a little bit left just because of the type of material that we're using at that time, but Danilo can tell better. But it was instead very satisfactory and exciting for me from the control point of view. Well, now I personally, I continue and caring about control, cooperation, complex robotic structure and so on, without being so much going into the detail of possible, again, possible material, a new technology for material and equation. Because from my point of view, even if I, I have always monitored elderly bio robotics, I think that robotics by itself is something that is natural or bionic. Because we are going to, from the very low level of the material, of the simple structure that together interact and giving a more complex behavior and such more complex behavior than interact with other complex behavior to produce something which is a high level behavior or differently maybe they they interact and produce an emergent behavior but there are also situations where typically using modular robotics where you have very simple actuation structure that just because they can communicate with some line that in, in, in biology could be some nervous channel, they exchange information and then if I have, if I have an objective can try to minimize or reaching the objective, the, the world experience with modular robotic design this way. So there was also in this sense, a sense of emerging intelligence intelligence can work at low level but it can also work at high level provided that from the low level that arrive the right information and from my point of view i see everything so strongly connected from high level let's say of artificial intelligence to the new technology and material possibly intelligence and so on that that there is a continuous stream so that's why I want to thank you for having invited me here and say that, okay, because also even if I feel part also of the bionic community. Thanks so much. Thanks very much. Well, you, you, you definitely belong to the bionics community. I, I, I think, I mean, in my view, you know, everybody who has to contribute to this understanding of uh, 
biological systems, uh, I think uh, is part of the bionic uh, uh, group. I mean, that's, uh, that's from, from, from my point of view. It's not, it's not coping, it's understanding. And, and to understand, you need to have uh, as many uh, contributions as, as, as possible from, from different fields. Uh, so, and in fact, we move from motor control to vision with the next uh, speaker, Concetta. Concetta. Hi, do you hear uh, me? Uh, yes, we hear you and we see you. Okay. <laughs> Great. So, <laughs> Great. Concetta, Thanks please. for the invitation. It's really nice to be again to, with all these old friends and go back to the history of 20 years ago. And I wanted to thank you and Paolo for the great achievement to the community and not only to the biorobotics or the robotics community in Italy that really flourish with your contribution, both of you, but also because us as neuroscientists, we really learned a lot for all your achievement and failures. Now, at the time, we were presenting uh, uh, a, a biological inspired visual model. It was aimed to do segmentation after the great success of David Mar and Tommy Poggio, segmentation of vision, of a visual image. And at the time, we were enough arrogant to think that we could really simply understand what was performed by primary visual cortex. Clearly, it was, uh, we were really arrogant because still we don't understand what really visual cortex is, what are the major canonical operations performed by primary visual cortex, because clearly it doesn't do only visual. Primary visual cortex is doing a lot of stuff. And now we started to understand that the motor, as Julia was saying, as Antonio was saying, as Paolo was saying, probably is shaping really the processing of a prim primary visual cortex, probably is shaping the timing of the processing of the visual information. And this is maybe very important. So what will be the future? Well, I don't know. But what I clearly know is that uh, the uh, the interaction with uh, the, your community for us as neuroscientists is extremely important. And uh, the fact that we don't understand completely even uh, primary in information processing, like a primary visual processing, is, is uh, overall a good news. Otherwise, you know, we, the brain will be, will not have the incredible capability of plastically adapted to change of information. We will not be able to make uh, processes for uh, blind people. I mean, all those really, because we can never, we can never think to really simulate perfectly all the peripheral sensory systems. So the fact that we have a very extremely smart primary visual cortex could be extremely important and useful to let the brain to adapt to, you know, not optimal restore visual input or sensory input. So I think that it would be extremely important that our field, human neuroscience, and your field really cross continue to cross fertilize in the future to really try to have a better model of the human perception at least. Thanks again and thanks Paolo for the happy birthday and thanks for all your achievement. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Concetta. Um, so, uh, Concetta, I, I don't know if David is there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, David is there. Sorry, just one second because the air conditioning. Okay, the, the, we had a very big noise here, so now it's uh, now it's much no. better. Our Sorry. air conditioning here is working very well. 
<laughs> yes, no, 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 but it was the air conditioning which was turned on and it was making, you know, a noise. <laughs> well, we've got some noises here too, but it's not air conditioning. Okay, so uh, please, Dave, uh, go uh, go ahead with. Uh, okay, your... hello, Giulio, and hello, Paolo, and happy birthday. Um, thanks for this. Uh, it, it is a bit of a blast from the past. Uh, being reminded of this conference 30 years ago, which was a great conference. Uh, and uh, I still remember quite a bit of it. And what I remember was that the emphasis seemed to be what can robotics learn from biology? It shouldn't be limited by it, but what can it learn from biology rather than perhaps the other way around? Now, maybe this was because at the time, uh, robotic systems, particularly computer vision, were extremely primitive. Just to give an idea, I remember uh, the a goal of of uh, recognizing a number plate was considered almost beyond reach, and and now and yet now this is something that we can uh, uh, we can all readily do. I'm not sure that it's improved humanity, but <laughs> it's definitely can a concerted does. Sorry, I've got Conchetta just right next to me and, and getting feedback. Um, but as Neville pointed out, uh, the interaction in the other direction, I think, is even, well, certainly for us in neuroscience, is even more profitable. Um, I think he put it very well in saying that when you try and create something, you see all the problems. Whereas when you're actually trying to analyze how a system works, you say, well, that can't be hard because uh, because the brain does it. And I think, seriously, computer vision and robotics in general have revealed uh, the nature of a lot of problems and also, I think, pointed to some solutions. And I'll give two examples, just very gen general examples. At the time, we were developing things like edge detection algorithms and we were pretty well obsessed with this idea of feed forward vision, starting in the retina, going to the thalamus, going to the cortex, uh, and so on. Um, it's now become very clear that that's not going to solve the problems, the delay loops and all the, all the other issues involved, and that vision must be active and it must be predictive. And the concept now of generative vision, of predictive vision, predictive coding, and so on, I think have taken a really strong hold. And a lot of the motivation for this has been much more from the engineering field than from physiology. And I think the other example, which uh, Conchetta alluded to, is the idea that we tended to think of all these systems as being completely isolated. We have vision, we have audition, we have touch. And these are different chapters in textbooks. but when we've actually got a perceiving machine, they have to be much more interconnected than we'd thought. And there are now examples of the visual cortex responding to sound and and uh, and, and and so on. And the multi-sensory approach, which uh, I've pursued quite a lot in in um, Julio's lab in in Geneva, together with his colleague, very talented Monica Gori. Um, I think is a very good example where that sort of approach, which was obvious to engineers, I mean, the iPhone uses everything it can to localize where it is, um, wasn't that obvious to the neuroscientists. So I think that's my main point, that what has happened largely due to this, these interactions, such as the one that you generated 30 years ago, uh, neuroscience has gained an enormous amount from robotics. And hopefully we'd like to think that robotics has gained something from us too. Thank you, and thanks for the invitation, and happy birthday. Sorry, thanks, thank, thank you, David. Thanks very much. Yes, I mean it is uh, it is this this point of bidirectionality of exchange is fundamental. Uh, that's uh, that's one of the the uh, the aspects we have maybe to continue to stress because uh, in principle and in words. Uh, this has been accepted by everybody, but in practice, uh, it's very hard. Uh, and, and in practice, I mean, you know, the career of uh, young researchers uh, is very much, uh, uh, is still very much uh, linked to, uh, you know, scientific communities, separated scientific communities, and so scientific societies uh, also, you know. So this is uh, something we still 
have to to fight uh, uh, to to change and uh, so thanks uh, so we move uh, I, I, I we move now you know to to Rugina Baichi, which uh, uh, i mean uh, i have to say that you know i still remember the the conference that uh, Rugina delivered here in Pisa. I mean, P uh, Paolo was still at the university, not at the Scuola Sant'Anna, when she presented the work on, uh, on active perception and exploration. This was one of the talks that uh, was uh, most in inspiring in, in my life, <laughs> in my scientific life. So I, I, I still uh, have uh, Rugina in, in my uh, scientific heart and also in my personal heart because she is a fantastic person. So I'm, I'm very glad uh, that she accepted to be with us uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, give us uh, her thought about uh, uh, what, uh, you know, how is bionics and what it was bionics. So Rugina, we, we uh, we don't uh, we we don't see I mean we don't see you we still see I think you have to share no no I I, I see that you are there but but uh, you have to what should I do yes we hear you Fine okay now. okay good ah, yes. here we yes. are perfect yes. So, good Thank afternoon, you. everybody, um, and happy birthday to Paolo. I remember him when we both were much, much younger. <laughs> I visited Pisa. I, I have the luxury of being retired, 88, and um, not have to write proposals, not raise money. So I have the luxury to think. And I, I, I really enjoy that. So here is what I don't want to talk about the past. Uh, actually, I was happy to hear that Mark Rybert is interested in dancing. I, I have done some work along those lines. It's really a very nice dynamical problem that you have to model, you know, the, the mutual uh, feeling. Uh, information that goes from kinematics and dynamics from one person to another. But in any case, what I am trying to do right now in my free time is thinking about the future. And I was happy to see or hear that several of you talked about the problem of intention and anticipatory control. Because <clears throat> what I observed is that if we really, I always assumed that robots should be helpers to human being rather than replacing robots. And especially as I get older, I can see a lot of the benefits of the technology to helping elderly people <clears throat> and generally people. So in order to, to carry out this agenda, I feel that we really need to much better understand how people act, how people reason and, uh, in, and use them as a part of interaction. And I learned 30 years ago when I worked with Vijay Kumar that to model and predict the dynamics of two systems is not a simple composition problem that you have to really model the whole system together because dynamics is not linear and therefore the superimposition doesn't work. So I am very interested in neuro, what neuroscientists have to say. And I learned the following thing, that apparently you generate a signal without being aware of it that is about a few seconds before you actually start to act on it. So you have a signal, which in my robotic terminology translates into emotion planning, and then a few seconds later, 
that signal gets gets communicated to the motoric part of your cortex, which then executes all the other actuation, et cetera, et cetera. So the big puzzle box is how does this signal get generated since you are not aware of it? And from all what I can gather from reading and is that there are three survival components in the biological system. One is you are hungry, one is you are thirsty, and one you want to reproduce sex. So these are the three components that <clears throat> generate this planning signal and then execute. So I like to prove this somehow. And this is my agenda for next few years. Thank you very much. And happy, happy birthday, Paolo. Be, be well, so, so that you can be like me, active at 88. Yes, thank you. <laughs>Okay, so there are, I mean, he's, uh, uh, Blake is, is, uh, is, uh, co is connected and listening to the speech and, and what we say, but uh, we cannot hear him. So we'll try to fix the problem. Apparently there is a, 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 a sort of a problem between Windows and, and Linux. Okay, so this brings us back to 1989. <laughs> it was not Windows at that time, but it was different anyway. Uh, Thanks. So, I mean, we have finished the, the, the we went through the list of, uh, let's say, the official speakers. So, I don't know if someone wants to uh, say something, uh, to comment, uh, because we still have uh, about 15 minutes. Uh, can, can I say something about the education? Of of course. Sure. Gina. So that there were several comments during this afternoon said that, well, you know, in order to make progress, we really have to somehow create this, what you called, Julio, the zoo grouping, you know, interdisciplinary. And there is a real problem in our educational system which is extremely compartmentalized. And it's not easy to really create these interdisciplinary groups so that, you know, students are interested to get their PhD fast, get a lot of publications, get good jobs. And so there is not really enough conducive atmosphere for this in curiosity driven kind of intellectually based environment. And I am afraid that unless we consciously start to break these walls, at least in some of these institutes, this is not going to uh, ergonomically happen. Well, Lugina, I, I I agree with you two hundred percent, and I know it is uh, it is very it is very hard, and and 
uh, you know, the, the academia is, uh, is the problem. <laughs> so I think that uh, we, yes. we really, I mean, as uh, let's say uh, people with the white airs, you know, I think we should, uh, we should fight against this because otherwise, uh, uh, you know, young people that are forced to make a career uh, within a, a, a constrained uh, uh, path, uh, uh, are not uh, going to form this zoo I was uh, I was referring to, and, and uh, this is going to be to be a problem. Also, uh, you know, the situation of publications and journals is terrible. I mean, yes. instead, of, instead yes. of having journals which activate and, and attract uh, multidisciplinarity, I mean, if you take uh, Nature, which is one of the best uh, journals. Uh, for sure, but it has been broken up into uh, 200 different nature this and nature that and nature the other, uh, which is uh, which is terrible because it again it's creating compartments uh, and uh, and forcing people uh, to to read uh, in just a limited uh, of of, uh, of knowledge. So that that's that's really the the, the problem. Uh, could I jump in here and make a comment with yeah, uh, yeah. Rosinas? Um, yeah. You know, you know, another thing that uh, I question is how many people are interested in being entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, early in their careers, um, and somehow, to my view, kind of skipping getting involved in really understanding a technology or a problem or or a science. And uh, uh, you know, I'm not. And there's a lot of univers There's universities now, kind of making that be a central uh, topic. And it seems to me, I'm not convinced that it has a good outcome. I would rather people, you know, get interested in some something uh, other than, uh, you know, just business. I guess. Yes. Yeah, yes. I can say yes. that as someone who's who started the business. Yes, uh, you know, pretty far along in the, in the process. Thank you very much. Yes, I plead for certain idealism in this regard. Right. Yeah, conviction that you really want, you know, you talk about commitment, conviction making a difference. I mean, you made a difference with those robots and I made a difference with creating an environment and, and cultivating a bunch of students who I am very proud of. But this is it. Yeah, another example is Rodney. I mean, he, yes, he, yes. He, was a, he has been a scientist along with, uh, with yes. an entrepreneur, you know. It's a, it's a good example. I think that, you know, people uh, sitting around the table and thinking about a new technology are crazy. I think they should st start from science and then from there, maybe going to technology, but uh, cannot, uh, you cannot do the reverse, I think. Yeah, I, I would like to encourage everybody, the panelists, of course, and uh, the attendees in person, or those connected to ask questions for these uh, remaining minutes. But I believe that uh, here we are discussing essentially very similar things uh, that we discussed in 1989, you know. So, for example, the issue of bionics, is bionics uh, valid? Is uh, uh, bio-inspiration uh, the right way to go? Uh, what about interdisciplinarity? Uh, on the other hand, we are all about uh, pursuing uh, application or more science. Uh, I think we have gained uh, 30 more years uh, of experience. Uh, we are older, as uh, Gina <laughs> uh, correctly said. And so we have got experience in everything, in, uh, in science, in technology, in education, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, enterprise. Yeah. So additional comments, uh, I tend to be optimistic. <laughs> And uh, I believe that what we are doing is valuable. Our students uh, are really have a remarkable, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, understanding of a set of problems that is not so easy to find in engineering in general. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, our, our uh, opinion can be different. And uh, so I like 
I see Rod. Rod has raised the hand. Rod. Rod. Yeah. Uh, thank. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, uh, you know, in the spirit of looking forward, uh, as Regina said, um, and uh, in the spirit of uh, science leading, um, uh, I'd like to argue or, or or disagree with something Mark Rabbit said, if I may. Um, Mark, you, 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 you talked about uh, robotic systems not necessarily having the same sort of actuators and material as biological systems, and and while that you know is, is, is probably uh, where we will be for a long time, I think we also um, miss something when we apply engineering principles to um, understanding how to build complex complex systems. Because we 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 you know got these brains that were built to be hunter gatherers. They're not very good actually at, at being able to think, and so we try to reduce things into deco decomposable components. And one of the things that we see in biology is the way the pieces interact with each other and build on top of each other, um, and 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 build these much more subtle systems that uh, are reductionist understanding is very hard to, to have of them. And so we may be missing all sorts of potential strength, strengths in, in an intellectual sense uh, uh, by using our reductionist <laughs> engineering principles. And I, I, see some, I see your machines behind you where you're, where, where you're building stuff in traditional ways. Um, uh, and so- This is, this is my home shop. I, I, I knew I could tell that. Um, and, uh, 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 so I, I think this, you know, I don't think I don't think you're really disagreeing with me because I would love to be able to do it the way biology does it if I could figure out how. But I, our schedule is to build something, you know, while I'm still yeah. alive. Yeah. So, so, so in in Rosina's terms, I'm looking ahead, and I think it's going to take us about three hundred years to understand how to <laughs> right. stuff to be figured out. Yeah. Let yep. me take the opportunity of you disagreeing with me with doing the uncomfortable job of agreeing with you. <laughs> Which was, uh, you know, I, I watched your your the talk you recorded, and um, um, I th I think that um, getting robots to be, you know, to move down the intelligence direction is what I would call it, even though you were focused on autonomy. But there's a lot of elements uh, is really what's needed next. You know, we've got a lot of low level functionality, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the pieces. But uh, combining it with more understanding of the world they're in, and uh, having being able to, you know, figure out how to do things, uh, make plans is really the next frontier, uh, I think. Right. Yes, you know, on, on the other hand, Atlas, I think, and you know, Atlas is is a demonstration that you can get inspiration from uh, from uh, biology and implement it using in a different using a different technology. Oh. Uh, because the, the, Absolutely. Movement is, the movement is very natural, and and so and, and the kind of movements you, you implemented with Atlas uh, is inspired by biology. So what I want to stress uh, once more is that uh, it is important to try to reach and you know, understand the principles behind. Then you can use a different technology. Otherwise, you know, with uh, with uh, if we are waiting for you know elastic muscles and and. Uh, and uh, three-dimensional, uh, you know, uh, processing units. Uh, 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 we have to wait more than thirty years, I think. So the the, the inspiration is is coming from biology, but it is re it can be re-implemented uh, uh, in, in in different ways. That that's that, that's what we should uh, we should pursue, I think. So are, are there other? Comments? Because well, I mean, I have I have one one question. I mean, maybe uh, a point to to raise, which is uh, somehow uh, related to the fact that uh, you know, in 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 eighty nine we were thinking about uh, uh, also you know developing new materials as as uh, uh, De Rossi was mentioning, and you know people were working on artificial muscles uh, and uh, you know biomorphic computers and and so on and so forth and and uh, um, we, we still don't have these you know and, and uh, uh, so uh, I wonder you know if 
uh, now there is a, a, a resurgence of uh, uh, soft robotics, you know, and the idea of implementing systems with soft materials. Uh, uh, but I, I mean, I personally don't don't see very much uh, uh, the kind of soft materials I was thinking, you know, back in '89, you know, with uh, uh, elasticity, implicit elasticity, and and the possibility of doing some kind of, uh, you know, uh, antagonistic motor control and so on and so forth. So, um, so I, I, I wonder, you know, if we are, we are really progressing there uh, or, or not? Very, very good question. Actually, here we have two people, <laughs> two leaders. Yes. Uh, Sheila Lasky, Barbara Mazzolai. Uh, Julia, we are progressing, but here, and I, I just graduated one student who has been looking at pouring and, and kneading, you know, materials, soft materials. And I have another student who is looking at the, the, the finite meshes. And so the theory and the analysis, not synthesis, synthesis is relatively easy, but the analysis of the interaction of these soft materials with physical interaction is non-trivial and we don't understand it. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Eugene. I was, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't know if uh, Barbara wants to, yeah. <laughs> wants to say Maybe something. Barbara, because I mean, yeah, it, it, yeah or Cecilia, I mean, you it can is, come here. Or, 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 just, or, 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 or Danilo, I mean, it's, uh, yeah. Because I mean, studying they were too young to be studying the elastic materials is something we have to do because we can then find different technology. But I mean, please, Barbara. I think that uh, we are still, uh, uh, I mean, in the basic uh, uh, concept. So that we need a, a lot of contamination from different disciplines because we need to understand the principle. So there are yeah. some uh, advancement in the study of the materials also in biology, but we need to work together, uh, not only take something from the other discipline, but really addressing the same problem together, because only in this way, probably, we can have a robot with new functionality in the next uh, year. So of course, we need uh, a lot of years, because it's very difficult to understand the basic principle. But I think that uh, something's changing, and there are really uh, people that work together to face uh, this problem. So I'm quite confident that in the next uh, future, we can see robots that can really operate in uh, real environments because this is the goal. And, uh, but it, of course, uh, we have to do a lot of stuff and uh, all of you, I mean, are great example for us. So you are the master. And uh, no, it's very important to, to mention that because for us, you are the inspiration as well. So it's a very important, your work in this field. So thank you to all of you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for your kind word. So we have two extreme, materials on one side, the neuroscience on the other. Right. Yes, yeah, sure. yeah, yes, the needle. But you, you should come here. Yeah, Danilo De Rossi would like to call me. Dan, Dan, Danilo, yes. With, with Danilo, once we, we, we had this, uh, this dream of, uh, of starting a company with the name of uh, Human Bodies and Spare Parts. You know? <laughs> okay, well, um, well, I'm prepared with that, but let me tell you one thing. Last conference I gave before your retirement so, was at the European Society for Artificial Muscles, which is the most society I probably, if none of you knows. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> and was called 30 Years Without Moving Me. That was the title of my talk. Because Choco, Pino, and other. I were mentioning moving a finger with polyelectrolyte gel fibers, making recruitment control, all of this. Last paper I made on this stuff was really a dielectric elastomer 
for moving and rehabilitation or process. Okay, beside that, let me say something. At the special muscle community, which is pretty active, I find myself as an engineer. Here, I find myself not an engineer, but a material scientist. And this gap is huge. Let me be more precise. Uh, the critical mass, uh, besides the recent work, which is well represented here, soft robotic, etc., important definitely, and probably can foresee far better. I found myself an engineer in the sense that material society can take a piece of whatever moving here, and they say this is an act without regarding torque or any anything, just moving. On the other side, the engineer necessarily want to buy components on the shelf. How can make complex architecture? We have to start from scratch. So this make almost impossible, or really not impossible, I'm sorry. Really slowly, slowly moving on this field. And uh, this is a pity because really concept like distributed intelligence, distributed actuation, but there is almost very few people, no, nobody doing this, having in mind the robotic area, except a few exceptions. All the rest is really material scientists can make something which movies over, if you push on it, give a signal. They say have a sensor or an act. Reliability, drivability, resistance, torque, force, are not a major. It's just showing, that's what we have also in robotics, is a show society. And you show that you have something which flaps, made of synthetic material. It's a wow. But this is well beyond making a working system. Last comment is, probably you are aware, probably not. Think about Teflon. Teflon is a passive material. Before the synth after the synthesis of Teflon, it took six years to make covering of a fried pan. Fifty years. And this is a passive material. If you think about an active material, active material are not engineered materials. Active material is something which change shape, change volume, change force. So we are really at the prehistory of this field. There are no engineering design rule, there is nothing. And the role really, I think, will take a lot. But in my opinion is, I can really think of a distributed propagating ionic signal into an arm. It's not science fiction. It really, to go from this to engineering, take a lot of things. We are using the mechanics of two centuries ago. We use computer science, but when we talk about this stuff, we talk about non-existent. Finally, I would think this area will be more something like synthetic biology, but not in, in the form of a simulation, in the form of making really life form like structure, which contract, move, expand, phototaxi, but making a full system by like this is far beyond prison. Thanks, Danilo. Is, 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 is the gap between nanoscience letters and transaction of robotics, uh, which doesn't pay in academia, you know. It's, that's, an, that's another hole, yeah. Uh, can I uh, just put a quick question? Sandro, yes. Sure. Yeah, very, just a simple, I mean, it's a brief question. And my question is, what do you think it is that main driving economical engines for bionics today and when i say i think of three of them one is manufacture and so you have the self-driving cars and this kind of things so and the other obviously is medicine and then there is entertainment and i don't know uh how what what you think it is the the are there more more significant uh, economical drivers or there are somewhat equivalent i, I just like some uh, analytical uh, perception uh, perspective 
personally believe that the medical field is a real driver. <clears throat> and it, it is also the area in which bionics is getting uh, the highest success. If you consider artificial organs, artificial limbs, uh, artificial, sen artificial sensory organs, the progress is uh, fantastic. And uh, in most of those applications, if, even if they are not uh, uh, what we could consider robotics uh, in a direct way, but certainly there is a convergence of different technologies, different knowledge, different aspect also, for example, of uh, acceptability, legal issues that make this field really, really interesting and driving other applications, the ones that mentioned, including robotics that is coming a bit, I mean, traditional service robotics or uh, uh, entertainment and so on. But my vision is that 30 years after, this is uh, uh, what is happening. I mean, artificial medical application for, for, for the, I mean, medical applications of bionics. Just to answer your question. Yeah, C Cesare, Cesare Stefanini asking a question. Uh, yeah, it's here. Sorry, Cesare. Paolo, thank you, Giulio. Hi for every, everyone the beautiful workshop. Uh, actually, uh, regarding the last question, I think there is one more area to consider, which is the one of uh, sustainability. So how to deploy robot bionic and robotic solutions to somehow help the ecosystem and the, let's say, nature itself. So in fact, we are opening a new area here at the Institute on uh, sort of repairing broken ecosystems by using artificial technologies, something interesting. Maybe this is a bit down the line, down the road, not, not now, but definitely I think this is one additional area, manufacturing, entertainment, and, uh, and healthcare. Thank you, Cesare. It's a very, very good point in my opinion. Okay, I, I think that uh, we are uh, close to the time to wrap up, close this uh, workshop. Let me say that uh, it has been a, a real privilege, a great pleasure uh, to see all of you together again in uh, good health and uh, with uh, very uh, smart, with uh, your experience, my experience, of course, sharing uh, uh, and making uh, a, a sort of, uh, how to say, taking a lesson of what happened. As you know, I, I tend to be optimistic. And uh, my personal view is that uh, 32 years after the, the workshop in uh, Chocco, we have uh, made uh, tremendous progresses. It is true that we have not uh, uh, provided all of what we expected to provide. This is a natural because uh, we were exploring new frontiers. Uh, we didn't have a, a direct, you know, like uh, the quest for the moon, uh, you know, a, a direct a specific goal. We were wondering, if you will, between science, engineering, and uh, uh, education, uh, like in a new, in a new, uh, in a, towards a new frontier. But uh, looking back, looking at what uh, we have accumulated, uh, I said that one on the one hand, for example, the field of materials, so the body, on the other hand, the uh, field of AI, and uh, especially uh, the understanding that uh, neuroscience, for example, it can be a drive. The driver. I think uh, Julio made very well this point, but also many of you. I think now many people believe that neuroscience uh, can be a, a good drive. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, some of us, Rodney, Mark, uh, uh, have demonstrated that uh, we can also explore the domain of industry very well. And I think we are educating students in a very, very good uh, way. Uh, actually, I believe there are very few fields of engineering in which uh, uh, what uh, uh, 
uh, Rodney and Julio remember as a zoo concept are implemented uh, as uh, in uh, this field of bionics, uh, by robotics, robotics, uh, uh, all of these. And so I'm very proud in a sense, so we run a, a, a relay race, if I say this correctly in English. And now it's time to leave uh, uh, our, our uh, experience and heritage to the next, uh, our students, who I believe, as uh, somebody said, Bar Barbara said that, I think on behalf of everybody, they consider us uh, as uh, anticipators and good sources for inspiration. By the way, thank you. Blake, for your words uh, in the chat, uh, you cannot answer directly, but thank you very much. So overall, I think that uh, we have done, uh, I say, we have lived a good life from this point of view. And uh, uh, as uh, Regina, Regina said, we can look for the future for a while, but also looking for the future to our students uh, who will explore these uh, uh, frontiers further. And I would like to conclude by thanking you again, thanking everybody, thanking Cecilia a lot and Giulio. Uh, I didn't do anything for this, uh, I must say. I, I formally ignored what they were doing. And so I really wish to thank them and all the people who worked uh, for this workshop. And for me, uh, I wish to thank all. For this so it has been a real pleasure thank you all for joining us thank you